and Steve Jablecki put his guitar up on the conveyor belt. And sometimes he wouldn't say the brightest things. The attendant there said, uh, what's in what's in this case? And Steve said, a bomb. <laughs> and I, I thought, Steve, wrong time for Jablecki. Yeah. <laughs> just just <laughs> dead wrong, pal. <laughs> so well, after a minor commotion, you know, um, we he opened it up and produced the guitar and <laughs> off on our tour. Um, that was good. We got late into maybe August, and we heard that there was a hurricane, Agnes, coming. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, we're just stoned hippies, and we're going up to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and, and we, who cares? We're leaving it in the rearview mirror. So we got up to Wilkes-Barre and we, we played our first night and it was great. We woke up the next morning and all these National Guard trucks are pouring into the, the parking lot and using it as a staging unit. And we said, what's going on? And they said, well, the hurricane caused flooding. It's overflowed the, the banks of... Uh, whatever, the Susquehanna River, the whole town is flooding across the river where your club was and all that. That's all underwater and under mud. And we said, uh, can we hitch a ride with you? And they said, yeah, sure. And so we got downtown to the edge of where the water was. And we, we jumped out, we climbed on a building and we got on the roof. Nobody was there. So we looked over the across the Susquehanna and wow. where our stuff was, it was just you know way underwater. So we uh hitched a ride back to the, the hotel and uh Steve Jablecki and Mike Messier, uh one of the roadies said, We'll stay here with the truck and you guys all go back to the mansion in the van and we'll see if we can salvage anything. And they they couldn't. It was all mud. Um, oh, oh. So we lost everything. Um, and the band kind of hit the skids. So I went, I, I, I mean, I had nothing. So I went back to P-Town and I started the only real job I ever had was washing dishes at one, some restaurant. And I made it to about day four. Uh, and I just said, I, yeah, I can't do this. <laughs> Uh, so somehow I got enough money to get a, to go up to a pawn shop in Central Square, and I bought a '55 Strat with a maple neck for 300 bucks. And uh, John Cool and Charlie and I started a trio called Choker, and we were playing all around Boston, and uh, we did a maybe four nights with Jeremy Spence and the children. Jeremy Spence was the slide player for Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, yes, he and, was. Yeah. And, right. And they were playing at the Whiskey in LA on a three night thing. And on the second night uh, during the break, Jeremy, he was tripping. He walked across the street and ran into uh, the children of God. And they started talking to him. And uh, he became one of the children. He never went back, never, you know. <laughs> They called could, the band a few days him. later, said, I quit, I'm out. That's right. The cult, yeah. The, uh, yeah. So wow. so we were playing um, Tatey's in Kenmore Square. And at this time, we were also friends with Aerosmith, who was trying to get a deal in uh, Boston. And Charlie knew Sib Haitian, who was yeah. Boston's drummer. Right. And he lived up in Lynn, Mass, and had a big place right on the the shore there. So we went to a big LSD party at his house, and everybody was just, you know, tripping like mad. Um, and finally, about two in the morning, we had had enough. Charlie and his girlfriend, Kathy, were there. They said, we're going for a swim. And I said, I think I'll drive back to the Cape. And it was like a two and a half, three hour drive. I drove home. Uh, but I met Sib from Boston and that was cool. Yeah. Uh, 
He he passed away what uh, a couple of years ago. Didn't yeah, he? that's absolutely absolutely yeah. true. That's, uh, that's... Shame. Uh, yeah. They were a great group. So yeah, very, very tight. Yeah. Very, yeah. Yeah. So le leaving out a, a couple of stories because there are always dozens, but Steve called me from the coast mm -hmm. and uh, Calvert and Marzano, they said, everything's happening in Hollywood now. Yeah. So Steve bought a house out in the valley, North Hollywood. And he said, uh, look, I'll send you a plane ticket. You come out here six months. We'll put a group together. They'll get us a new deal, make a new record, and then you can keep your residence on the Cape, and we'll just tour. So I said, fine. Well, my friend, the finger-picking Steve Blodgett, rode with me. And we're flying out, and the, the captain says, now look down on your right. You'll see the Grand Canyon. And we look down, and sure enough, he, he said, I'm going to just take a flight, a circle around it here for a minute so you all can see it really good. And we had a great view of it. So then maybe an hour later, he says, now we're coming into Los Angeles. And everybody looked down and all we could see was an orange cloud. Yeah, Because that was when people were taking smog pills and stuff like that. <laughs> the cloud inversion layer trapped it all in. Well, Steve had a nice house and Mike Messier, one of the roadies was out there and uh, his wife, Brenda. Well, the Musicians Contact Service on Santa Monica Boulevard was the place that you would go and look for musicians. And you'd, you'd register with them. You'd put your name on a five by seven card. You'd say what you're looking for, bass and drums, and leave your number. So we went through a lot of folks. The first drummer we got was Bobby Zamora, who played with Ruben and the Jets. And that was a, a Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention spinoff. And uh, and Bobby was Mexican, and he had a great Latino kind of beat. Uh, we, had, we did one or two songs that I had written, one called Seagulls Flying, and it, it just had a, a tremendous kind of Latin feel. Uh, When it came time, we were we were taping, the producers were taping all the practices. Yeah. And they said, you know, Bobby's great on the, the Latin stuff, but he, he doesn't have the rock chops. Keep looking. So we found Dave Atwood, who was the first drummer for America, horse with no name. Yeah, and, yeah. and David played in the studio and like that, and he, he was good. Um, so we went in the studio and we went in with Dave. And we did uh, dreams, reality, or hold on to your dreams. That was that I re-recorded with Steve Perry years later, in yeah. seventy-five, seventy-six. Actually, Steve Perry and I met in seventy-five, and another one um, called "It's Over." But when we got to hold on to your dreams, Dave Atwood just couldn't get it. So the producers called, time out, time out. We're, we're taking a two-hour break. You go down to Studio Instrument Rentals and see if you can find a drummer. <laughs> so I got in the car and drove over to SIR. And it, I walked into one of the big sound stages, like where Deep Purple would rehearse or something like this. And there's a guy building a sound stage, a, a carpenter. And I said, hey, man. I'm looking for a drummer to do a session right now. Do you know anybody? I He said, yeah. I said, great. Who is it? He said, me. I said, well, who are you? He said, I'm Ron Bushy from the Iron Butterfly. Oh, okay. The Iron Butterfly? Huh? And in 68, 
I was at like pot parties at college and we were listening to Inagata DeVita with the black light on, <laughs> along with Steve Miller's Children of the Future. I said, this is unbelievable. I said, uh, can, you, can you go right now? I, I said, how much will you charge? He said, 15 bucks a side. Uh, he was making 275 banging nails. And so I, on the way over to the studio, I started talking about his career with the Iron Butterfly. And I, he, I said, gosh, what's the most you ever made? He said, we, we made $80,000 playing in Honolulu. One song, 30 minutes in Agata de Vida. I said, wow. So what are you doing as a carpenter? He said, well, bad real estate investments and a lot of drugs. I said, oh, man, that's terrible. So we went in the studio. First take, he nailed it. I drove him back to SIR and got his name and his phone number because I wanted to stay in touch with him. And at a subsequent later date, I went out to his place and I think we were both tripping. And he had the gigantic Anvil Road case that said, Ron Bushy, Iron Butterfly. But, you know, your eyes kind of are doing this. And it said, I Ron Bushy Fly. What? <laughs> 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 anyway, back, back to the session, we, we mixed up the songs and it was late. And Steve and I were went through uh, you know, Laurel Canyon, went over Mulholland Drive into the valley. And out of nowhere, there's this redhead hitchhiking. And, and we picked her up. And I mean, she was probably 24, beautiful, long red hair, just an incredible body, drop dead gorgeous. And... Um, she said, I just got thrown out of my house. I got no place to go. Steve said, well, you can come stay with us. So we, we got back to the house and we said, we just recorded these songs. You want to hear them? She said, sure. Um, so Steve said, well, the, I got the player in the bedroom. So let's go in there. Uh, so he puts the tape on. And I mean, with, within 30 seconds, the girl was naked and they were going at it. And uh, on the about the third song, I was naked. We were going at it, and at the end of it, we said took a line out of the Beatles. Uh, uh, I hope we passed the audition. <laughs> right. But she ended up moving in for a while, and then more girls moved in, and uh, they worked at like receptionists at record companies and things like that. So. They knew everybody coming in and out. And there was a, a, a very nice black lady named Monica. And she said, oh, Bonnie Bramlett was in today. And she's looking for a guitar player. And she's playing at the Palomino Club uh, where Linda Ronstadt and the Stone Ponies and some of the Eagles and stuff broke out of in the North uh, Hollywood area. So I called her up and she said, yeah, come here for rehearsal. And I met her and we rehearsed and uh, maybe twice. And then it was gig night and I showed up in a, in a red velvet suit with a black shirt and a, a shag haircut. And she, you know, she and Delaney had just finished uh, Delaney and Bonnie and Friends and was playing with Eric Clapton. So she kept looking at me and saying, you know, you remind me of someone. You remind me of someone. And insinuating Clapton. Um, so we get out there and we did Since I Met You, Baby. And uh, she sang Since I Met You, Howie McDonald. My, uh -huh. my life will never be the same. So we stayed in touch. And uh, many years later, there's an Almond Brothers story associated with that. But we're on the Wadsworth Mansion today. So uh, Steve and I, then is, we had the tapes and whatnot, but we didn't really have any gigs. Well, we, our, our first gig was, I think, I forget the name of the place, but Steely Dan had played there the night before. And the place was packed. And we played there and there was maybe 45 people. So we we were going through some hard times and 
we some days would scrape together enough money or Coke bottles and we could buy, we'd go to Jack in the Box and we could buy one Jack burger and split it, you know. Um, it, it's tough when you, you know, just call, go to a new state with no job or anything. But we uh, eventually by November, we got booked at the Whiskey. Mm -hmm. And on the strength of our tapes, a guy named Michael Phoebus from GRT uh, recording company uh, came out and saw the band. Uh, mm -hmm. And on that show, uh, Rob Roberti was our drummer and Leah Santos, fabulous singer. They had come out from Long Island and Leah knew Kathy McDonald who took over in Big Brother and the Holding Company after Janice. So she was a Bay Area legend and she had an album out on Capitol Records called Insane Asylum. So, and then Eddie Rodriguez, conga player, who Rob and Leah knew from Long Island, who had also come out. If Rob couldn't make a gig, then Eddie would fill in. And he was a really good singer too. Uh, so we're at, we're at the Whiskey. We got the deal. Michael Vivas offered us a deal. And so we were all just, ecstatic finally um our bass player was a guy named skip perkins and he was in the navy on okinawa with gary hayes dave hayes my former bass player's brother wow okay <laughs> so i mean it's a small world yeah throughout <laughs> 55 years you wouldn't believe how <laughs> many things intertwine uh, yeah. well we, we used to play up on the sunset strip uh up from the whiskey before we got our whiskey date at a place called bill gazari's and bill was famous for having a a hundred dollar prize for the dance contest and whatnot but he had three stages and would always have three bands so mm -hmm. the first band would play and at least a half a dozen times we played the next band that played was Van Halen and, okay. and they, and then would play. Well, they, they did strictly covers mm -hmm. and they would end up with LaGrange. Uh, so, the, uh, and we, and we knew LaGrange. So what we'd do is they're in the end where Billy Gibbons is crank, crank, yeah. all these pinched harmonics and then we'd start up and start playing along with them. And then Eddie and I would get into a guitar battle. And uh -huh. and then we'd meet, the first band would come back on, we'd go out behind Jack's liquor store and would drink or smoke or they were, they, I think, oftentimes drunk, put some speed in a Jack Daniels bottle. But, uh, but we had a great time and we got to know each other decently well. In fact, they had a softball game out at their house in Pasadena once a month. And, my girlfriend Cece and I went out there one on one of those softball games too. Well, talk talk a little bit about the the nascent Van Halen. Were they a lot rawer back then? You know, in the early days, and was uh was uh, David Lee and yeah, David Lee the showman that he became, or you know, what what were they like in their early early days? So so David Lee was a wild man then, and and he couldn't sing. But he had a couple of screams and squawks and a, a couple of um, Taekwondo moves. So he was a pretty good showman. I'd rate him a five as a singer. Um, but it, his tricks and antics got him across. Well, they did not do any originals. And we were on a break at the time. And I said, Eddie, how come you guys don't do any originals? Do you have any? And he said, yeah, we're working some up, but we're not going to play them until we're ready to debut as an all original band. And I said, OK, cool. Uh, that makes sense. Um, but Ed, they did uh, Rocky Mountain Way and Ed, Eddie had one of those magic bags, the voice box where it had the tube and he did the. Wah, 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 wah. Uh, yeah. You know, no, like Peter Frampton did and something. Yeah. Um, 
and they did star tripping or I think our space truck or whatever it was called the uh, deep purple song at the time. Um, and, and they were all, they probably did something by uh, Iron Maiden, um, but they were all hard rock covers, yeah. basically. And they were just as wild. Michael Anthony was, was very quiet. When, whenever we hung out, he almost was not even there, kind of the invisible man kind of thing. And Alex Van Halen, he was really vocal and fun. And what I realized when they first came out, when I saw them down at the Starwood, which was another big club that we were playing at, my girlfriend Cece and I went there to see a group called Straw Dog, and we saw Hubie Heard in his kind of disco suit, lying, sitting on the steps, kind of stretched out. And she said, that's Hubie Heard. He, he plays with Billy Preston. And that's when Billy had three keyboard players, H Hubie, Kenny Lover, and himself. And they did the Will It Go Round in Circles and uh, a few other songs before that. I introduced myself to Hubie, told him I was a guitar player. And he said, man, I'm thinking about putting a group together. Give me your number. And so we did. We created a group called Silver Platinum and Gold that was half of Ike and Tina's band, half of Billy Preston's band, and me as the, the white token Jimmy Hendrix <laughs> guitar player. Uh, but they were great guys and great singers and so much fun. Van Halen, I was there with another guitar player, a friend of mine, Peter Glindeman, I think maybe our, my drummer, Rob. And Eddie came out, and all of a sudden, he's dive-bombing and tapping and whammy-barring and pinched harmonics. Boom! That trigger noise he made, like like the horse neighing, and uh, yeah. and and my my buddy Pete Glindeman said he didn't play a legitimate note all night. It was <laughs> all just tricks and noise. But um, Ted Templeman on a on a tip uh, went down there. Rodney Binghamheimer, who used to play the records up at Gazzari's called uh, Ted Templeman. First, he called Gene Simmons, who produced a small demo on him that didn't do anything. And then Ted Templeman came and heard him. And uh, then he called the president of Warner Brothers Records, said, we're going to sign this group. I think it was Mo Austin. They came the next night and saw him and signed him. Um, yeah. and, you know, the rest is rock and roll history there. And you mentioned a little bit ago about recording with uh, Steve Perry. At the time that you met him, recorded, could you see potential if he was placed with the right backing band that he would really go places? Absolutely. Um, I used to go to the Songwriter Showcase, John Brahini and Bones Howe and a bunch of other BMI guys and stuff. And they said, if you if you're gonna make it, you need a music business attorney. Yeah. And so I got a reference, a guy named Andy Stern. Paid me, called him up. I gave him a hundred dollar retainer to go in and talk with him one day. And I told him what I was looking for, a great lead singer. And he said, Well, there was a guy in here yesterday with Steve Cropper. His name's Steve Perry, and he's looking for a band or a project. I said, oh, uh, can you hook us up? He says, well, let me call him and see if it's okay to give him your number. And he called him and Steve said, sure. So I made plans to drive out to his mom's house. And it was a good bit. And he was a drummer at the time. He was a singing drummer. And we got out there and I had maybe 12 club songs to play like all right now and maybe taking care of business or whatnot you know and steve sang every one of them and as we were playing through it i said man this guy is good we did a few more i said wow this guy is really good and by the time we finished i said man this dude is like got it over robert plant yeah so i i said all right well I want to do some recording. I've got a bunch of songs to choose from. Are you interested? And he said, yeah. 
So on another date, he came over to my apartment and I played him maybe 10 songs, Stronger and Stronger, Dreams Reality was one, and um, It's Over, which I had just recently written after studying at the Dick Grove Conservatory of Music and Howard Roberts Guitar Institute of Technology. I was a, on his first class. Uh, and then another one he wanted to do called Any Way You Want It. Oh, okay. Um, so I said, I I'm doing an Asian tour for three months. And when I come back, we'll, we'll record it. He said, okay, great. Well, we rehearsed on up to it. We went to the movies together and saw all the president's men. And um, we were kind of hanging out. And then I went to Asia for three months on a tour and came back and said, hey, I'm ready. He said, okay, great, I'm ready. So I found a studio, Star Trek studio, and we booked it. And he said, just one thing. I said, what's that? He said, I don't want to record any way you want. Hmm. I, I, I said, well, okay, you know, two out of three ain't bad. We could probably get a deal on the basis of that. Well, we're in the studio and I had Hubie Heard on the organ. I had a guy named Robin who was the drummer for the New Birth who did Wildflower. Yeah. Jesus, sweet and gentle flower. Well, that's a great, uh, yeah, great right uh somehow we hooked in with uh the new birth ltd and earth wind and fire um and they used to come out to our rehearsal place and jam for five or six hours and would only stop for a handful of peanuts or a beer or something like that we were tight and i one of these songs it's over i thought i said he'd be good for it so I had an all-star cast, Mark Levine, my roommate, who uh, played bass on Johnny Rivers' Slow Dance into the music. Uh, that was the first gold record he played on it. Then he played with Barry Manilow for the next 28 years or something. Um, and that's a whole lot of stories. I've got a, on my YouTube channel, I've got an interview with Mark Levine. And he tells a lot of great stories about Stevie Wonder and Dionne Warwick and all this stuff. So. We're in the studio and and Robin just, he wasn't playing right. And mm -hmm. oh, I also had Tony Carey, my friend Tony Carey, who was in Blackmore's Rainbow. Mm -hmm. And he just uh, on the first, Richie Blackmore from Deep Purple, his first solo project was Rainbow. And Tony was the keyboard player on the first album. So I had a lot of incredible players there. I might have even had Bobby Zinner a uh, guitar player in the group I was in called The Force. Because when you're in LA, you're in about three or four bands at once because you never know what's going to take off. So you play with everybody you can, whenever you can. I I even did a Sunday night gig with Nolan Porter who, who did a, an R&B song called Nolan Porter. So, so we're in the studio, we're recording. And Robin's not cutting it. So I kicked him out. I called Rob Roberti and Rob came over and played uh, the, the track to hold on to your dreams stronger and stronger. Because he had been playing it in the band with me and Jablecki. That was one of our songs. So I was always curious to why Steve didn't want to record any way you want it. And a lot of people, after I did my story about who's the best rock singer I ever worked with? Steve Perry, of course. Um, I, I told this story and a lot of people are saying, well, are you saying that you wrote any way you want it, that Steve wrote with Neil Schoen? And I said, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I present a song that had the same lyrics as the chorus to that song. And it had the same music part to stronger and stronger that that chorus was put on and then all the rest was different um so possibly subconsciously i had a little something to do with maybe of that seed growing into the nine million dollar flower that it became uh, i didn't see a cent of it but i don't care you know i i play music for me and I'm, i don't do it for money so right. I do it for 
for the love of music. Uh, but at any rate, we were in there and the band left and Steve and I are in the, the control booth. And this one song, It's Over, is an unbelievably pretty ballad. And Steve and I did 28 takes of it. I mean, it, it's a classic song. People write me all the time and say, you and Steve should re-record that. Basically, when the songs were all mixed and it was time to go, uh, and I had some record labels interested, I called them up and he said, well, I just joined a new band called Journey. Yeah. So I'm not available anymore. I yeah. said, okay.